Tonight, we're going to discuss the second of the provisions that Jesus made for his disciples, which we call ordinances. Special provisions for the life that he's called us to live. And this second ordinance, or second provision we're going to talk about tonight is New Testament baptism. And New Testament baptism is also an important plank that we need to lay at the foundation of our Christian experience. It, it, there's so much that God wants to do in us and through us and for us in the whole area, this whole area. And so we're going to discuss it together. It also is one of the most controversial areas that we can talk about because you well know that depending on what Christian church you happen to go to, the whole process and methodology in baptism is very different. So what I'd like for us to do is to be able to lay aside, if we can, whatever we've, our understandings have been in the past, and, I, and let's just look into the scriptures to see what the Bible has to say about baptism. And of course, we have to take a position on baptism, and so uh, you'll see right there at the beginning on the first part of your notes that uh, we have a definition of baptism, and this is what we suggest. Now, you may have a different definition, and that's all right. But we say that baptism is the immersion or dipping of a candidate in water on profession of their faith in Christ. Okay, well, who are the proper subjects for baptism? Well, these are confessed Christians who have experienced a new birth and thus have been brought by the Holy Spirit in the eternal family of God. Okay, now that kind of lays the background. You may have a different understanding, but that's where what we, we, are, we see from the scriptures and we're going to try to uh, validate in your hearts tonight as we go along. I think everyone who is a Christian will agree that baptism is an, a matter of obedience. It's not an option. It's a, an essential part of what Jesus has asked us to do. And to refuse to do it is to live in disobedience to the revealed word of God. So why should we be obey this this? Uh, admonition for baptism. Well, there's several reasons right in your notes. First of all, it obeys the command of Jesus. And uh, Jesus said, go into and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One thing I've learned, having operated now in some non-Christian countries, India in particular, for eight or nine years, and that is that persecution in this setting where there's a pagan group of people, persecution usually is keyed around baptism. In other words, a person can come, they can come from instruction, they can gather for worship, and they can become friendly with a Christian group or with Christian missionaries or whatever, whatever, but if and when they decide they're going to be baptized, then that's a whole different ballgame. It's like it's a turning point. It's like they are now committed to a new life, to live a new way, different from the way in which they were raised and the way in which their ancestors uh, walked. And so, this is a very serious thing. In our country, it's not nearly as serious because we're all sort of so pseudo-Christian here anyway, and baptism is just an accepted thing, and everybody, you know, it's, sometimes it's a growing up right that people engage in sometimes as part of being bo born. It's a, a, a part of the birth process, depending on what church you belong to or what church you've come up through. But you go to India or you go to China or you go to some other country like this that is basically Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist, and you take New Testament baptism, and wow, it is a whole different proposition. It's almost like I heard once about the Roman army that invaded England many centuries ago. And of course, to do that, they had to leave the continent and go across the English Channel, and they had these huge armada of ships to do that, and they landed on the shore in England and looked back to see a pillar of fire, and to their consternation, their ships were burning. The general had set fire to their ships because he wanted those troops to know there's no way back. We either conquer or we're killed. There's no way back. Now, wasn't that what we learned last week was happening to the people, children of Israel? It says that they were baptized into Moses in the Red Sea, in the pillar and the cloud in the Red Sea, because after that took place, there was no way that they could go back 
They had only one way to go. It was forward. And that's what baptism is like. And people in non-Christian lands understand that with a lot more uh, vigor than we do in this country. Well, write in your notes next. Not only is it obey the command of Jesus, it follows the example of Jesus. There isn't anything that Jesus was going to ask us to do that he did not do himself. And we're going to see in a couple of weeks more about how baptism actually launched Jesus into his ministry. And so he went to the Jordan River and he was baptized by John. But it didn't just stop there. Because if you look carefully at the New Testament, you'll realize that there was a baptismal revival going on during those years. I mean, John was baptizing hordes of people, John the Baptist, but it says in the scriptures that all Jerusalem and Judea came down to be baptized by Jesus. Well, now, that's a Hebraism. doesn't mean every cotton-picking, living, breathing person in Jerusalem and Judea went down to be, but it means a vast majority of them went down, and it says in John 4 that Jesus and his disciples baptized more than John did. So baptizing was an important part in Jesus' ministry and his example. In the third place, write down, it follows the example of the apostles. What happened in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost? Peter, under the now empowering of the Holy Spirit, got up and preached that first great sermon of the church, and what was the result? The people were convicted, and they said, Peter, what shall we do? And what was Peter's response to them? His response was, repent and what? Be baptized, every one in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, Philip was having a great revival up there in Samaria, and it says, they believed Philip's message, Jesus the Messiah, and many men and women were baptized. So baptism becomes, you see, something that is carried on by the disciples. What it really is in its obedience as we follow it out, it's like an outward sign of a change within the heart. And uh, baptism, so baptism is not only following the command of Christ and the example of Christ and the example of the apostles, but baptism is also like a soldier putting on his uniform. Now, some of you served in the armed forces, and uh, you're well aware of the fact that when you uh, swear that you will become a, a member of the armed forces, what happens is this. You're mustered in, and the first thing you're told to do is go to the quartermaster, and he'll issue your uniform. Put on that uniform, keep it pressed, keep it spick and span, keep the shoes shined, and so forth. Why? Keep it spotless. Why? Because it shows that you now are a member of the armed forces of the United States. It's the symbol that says, I am now uh, under the employee of Uncle Sam. And so the respect for those armed forces goes with you. And the symbol is to be kept in good condition and bright and shining. That's the way it is with a Christian. Jesus is inviting people. He doesn't draft them. He recruits them. He invites them into his army. And he says, would you come now and be my followers? And if you will, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be baptized. I want you to go to a public place, and I want you to put on this symbol, this uniform, that shows that you are now going to be giving your life to me, I want you to be baptized. Not only is it like a soldier putting on his uniform, but in another sense, it's like a public marriage ceremony. Here's two people who's given their hearts to each other. And uh, the day comes when they stand before a minister or a justice of peace or somebody who is in authority, and that person says to uh, Mr. Brown, will you take Miss Smith to be your lawfully wedded wife? And he says, I will. And she says, will you take this man, Mr. Brown, to be your lawfully wedded husband? He says, I will. And from that moment on, for the rest of their life, they're bound together. And this ceremony, this public wedding ceremony, dramatizes this. Now, if Miss Smith is a faithful and loving and devoted wife, she'll bless Mr. Brown and be an honor to his name for the rest of his life. If she's not loyal to him, she can dishonor him. That's the way it is with Jesus. When he says, come, I want you to follow me. Now I want you to be baptized. 
what he's basically saying is, I want you to proclaim before everybody that you and I have become one. That from now on, you've taken my name, you've taken my future, you've taken my purpose, and from now on, I want you to live with me and honor me before men. That's what baptism is all about. And for years, I understood that this was part of baptism, but this public declaration sense of baptism, as I went deeper into the scriptures, I realized only begins to scratch the surface. There's so much more to it than that. And in our country, because baptism is kind of a tradition that's very much accepted, it loses much of its meaning. And it's kind of a surface thing for many people. Well, tonight I want to ask the Holy Spirit to break us away from that and to show us from his word what it really is all about. And so I'd like to just say for you to read with me uh, these verses in Romans 8, for the, in your, the next page of your notes, for the power of the life-giving spirit has freed me from the vicious circle of sin and death God sent his son in a human body like ours, except that ours was sinful, and destroyed sin's control over us by giving himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, how many of you are aware of the fact that often life becomes a vicious circle? <laughs> I mean, we try to do what God wants us to do, and then we fall back. And then we try again, and we just can't seem to make it. The Lord wants to come and break into that vicious circle. He wants to shatter the old life in pieces so its functioning capacity is not left intact. Now look at the first paragraph in your notes. Baptism is part of the provision Christ made for our life in him. All that Christ's death and resurrection accomplished for us is conveyed and made real in believer's baptism. I'd like for you to underline the words conveyed and made real. All Christ's death and resurrection accomplished for us is conveyed and made real in believer's baptism. We believe him to set us free from all that would bind and hinder and drag us down and hold us back as we seek to move on into the full life Christ has for us. Christ wants to actually accomplish something in our life. That's why I think, this, just like the Lord's Supper, this ordinance has more to it than just a function. It has some sacramentalism to it also. In other words, it has something that is to be conveyed to us. It has something to impart. Is it salvation? No. We're saved by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But what is it? What is it that we can receive and appropriate? What is the work that he wants to have done in our life? Well, there are several things I think that in baptism we can grab a hold of in our spirit, in our life. And the first is this. We can take authority over the dominion, the domination and power of sin. It talked about the vicious circle of death, sin and death being broken in Romans 8. Well, here in this verse, Romans 3, it says, sin's power over us was broken when we became Christians and what? And we're baptized to become part of Jesus Christ. Through his death, the power of of your sinful nature was shattered. God wants to, there is a lingering, no matter even if we've given our hearts to Christ, there is a lingering power of sin in our life that needs to be broken. And so in Romans chapter 6, Paul goes on. And you can write these uh, different uh, statements that he makes in your notes, if you will, as we go along. And we're going to go pretty quickly, so you'll have to write uh, fast. But anyway, verse 5, what does he say? What does it say? It basically says, we died with Jesus. For you have become a part of him. So you died with him, so to speak, when he died. Jesus was our substitute. We've already learned that, okay? In verse 5, it says, we died with Jesus. Verse 6, it says, our old desires are nailed to the cross. Your old evil desires were nailed to the cross with him. One minute. We're under sin's control. The next, he's taken our place, and he's died for us. And now sin has no more authority to control us anymore. So verse 7 says, tells us sin has no more authority. 
Now sin is the intruder. Now we can look at temptation. We can look at what Satan is trying to do and accomplish in our lives. We could say, you have no right here. Be gone. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. I will not accept your influence in my life any longer. Sin has no more authority. And he sums it up in verse 11, where he says, we are dead to sin and alive to God. One of the versions says, reckon yourself. That means consider that you are now dead. Dead people are unresponsive, right? So you don't have to respond to sin anymore. The have to is broken. So look upon your old sin nature as dead and unresponsive to sin, and instead be alive to God and alert to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Does that mean that we'll never have any more problems? We'll never face any more temptations? No. It just means that we don't have to yield to them anymore. It just means that there is a superior power operating in our life over the drawing power of sin that is operating in our flesh. Hallelujah. So right in, in, in your, the bottom part of your page there. So as you are baptized into his death, you are set free from the authority and power of sin. This is made real to us in baptism. It's made where we, by faith, can get a hold of it. And so this is one of the things that God wants to do for us as we come to him. Another thing that he wants to do for us is that he wants to us, that we can claim freedom from our sin. Not only can we take authority over our sin nature, but we can claim freedom from our sin. So, dear brothers, it says in Romans 8, you have no obligation whatever to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. If, through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you crush it and its evil deeds. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that there are two things that we can claim freedom from. Two things that the Holy Spirit will help us to deal with and we can get a hold of this in baptism. The first is this, right in your notes. It's the natural hostility to God and his ways that we were born into this world with. We came down the birth canal with this. And all the people around us struggle with it. The natural hostility to God and his ways. And we can declare freedom from that. From now on... Even though we were born this way, nobody had to teach us how to sin. It was just very natural for us. We always took the first biggest, the first, uh, we always wanted to be first in line. We always took the biggest piece of the cake, uh, plate on the, uh, of cake on the plate because, number one, we're sitting on the throne of our life. I mean, we were centered around ourself. But now, God takes us and he wants to break that power within us, that, that hostility that naturally resists God and his ways. That thing within us that's when we hear God saying, this is what I want you to do, or this is the way I want you to go, or here's how I want you to live. If it's totally contrary to the way the other people around you are living, and something in us says, <clears throat> no, I don't want to do that, God. No, I'll look like a freak. No, this won't be, uh, I'll be the only person walking in this direction. God wants to take that hostility and he wants to break it. Take the fight out of us. You look in uh, Romans 8, 7 where it says, The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. And God wants to deal with that. Not only does he want to deal with that, but also, right in your notes, he wants to deal with the lingering effects of the many years when Big number one, I was sitting on the throne of my life. The many years when I operated out of pride and selfishness and lust and uh, anger and resentment. He wants to take all this legacy of our sinful past and he wants to remove it from us. And you'll notice that in your notes it suggests that this involves such things as habits. Okay, we've come to Christ now, but for all these years, we've developed certain habits in our life, and so we automatically respond according to those habits. No, that's not what God wants. 
the desires, the patterns that we've been operating on, the goals and motivations that we have, the past experiences with control our behavior because for coming from hurts and fears and resentments, all of this, Jesus wants to help us with that. He wants to take the hostility away, and he wants to take the lingering effects away, too. Now, I enjoy doing some gardening, and uh, although I didn't have real good success this year, I guess it was too rainy and dark, <laughs> but I usually like to grow some nice, big, juicy tomatoes. And I'm not the world's best gardener, but I know this. I know that if I take a little budding tomato plant, or not budding even, just a little shoot of a tomato plant, and I stick it into the ground in the middle of a weed patch, that tomato plant's going to have a rough time. I mean, I may look at that tomato, and I may, you know, give it some loving care and attention, and I may urge that tomato on, go, tomato, grow, go, tomato, grow. But you know what? It just hardly has any strength or energy at all because all of its energy is fighting off these weeds that are all around it. And at the, come August, I'll be lucky to get a little marble, let alone a nice big beefsteak, right? Well, I know better than that. So I come, I dig up the ground, I get all the weeds out of there that I can see and get rid of. Then I plant the tomato in this piece of ground and I give it some loving care and attention and wow, what a difference. Now I say, go, grow, tomato, grow, and it just grows up to be a nice, big, healthy plant. Now some other weeds will come up, of course. Well, we can take care of those as we go along. But it got a good start. I believe that's what God wants to do with us as we follow him in baptism. I believe he wants to just prepare the ground. I believe he wants to get rid of all these lingering bondages and holdups and things that uh, come from the old life. And he wants to set us in a place where now we actually can begin to grow. How tragic it is that many Christians, young Christians, come to the Lord, clap them on the back, Oh, good. Wonderful. Now, just live for the Lord. Grow for him. And so, in so many respects, they're set right back out in the old wheat patch. And their cheerleaders, Christian cheerleaders around them say, Grow, Christian, grow. Grow, Christian, grow. Well, they can hardly take a breath as a Christian. I mean, they are so bombarded. They are so pulled in every direction. How are they ever going to be able to grow? They'll be fortunate to sustain any life at all. But if we can weed the patch, if we can get the ground prepared, if we can break the past off of their back, and Jesus' blood can completely free them and set them free, then we can really see growth begin to take place. So as you see, there's a, 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 a real function here that baptism seems to play. In fact, the Apostle Paul, interestingly enough, in Colossians chapter 2, talks about this whole thing in terms of a circumcision. He calls it a circumcision of the heart. Look at the note in your, in the verse there, Colossians 2.11 in your notes. In him, you were also circumcised in putting off the old sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision that's done by Christ. Circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign of the fact that these people now belong to God. And it was a physical sign in their bodies. It was a cutting away. It was getting rid of the unnecessary things in their life. And, and those could, could be a source of disease and could pull them down. It was freeing them up uh, to be fruitful in God's, in God's kingdom. And it showed that they had separated themselves unto the Lord. And the Lord was very, very um, determined that this take place, that his people show this sign. In fact, he almost killed Moses one day because Moses had forgotten to circumcise or had overlooked circumcising his, his boys. The, the children of Israel couldn't go into the land of promise because they had neglected this 
physical sign of circumcision. And so God said to Joshua, before they go in, before I give them the land, every male has to be circumcised, even at the advanced years, as painful as that would be. And so they were. That was the first thing. This was important to God. And so now Paul is saying that it isn't so much what happens on the outside, but it's rather on the inside. It's, it's not the outward circumcision that's important. But what's important is that your heart be circumcised, that the dead skin be cut away, that the old, that which isn't necessary be removed, so that all the control factors that Satan has over you, all the habits, all the traits that were part of the old life are cut away and buried so you can live the life that he now wants you to live. Look at the paragraph there in the middle of the page. As we are baptized into his death, we can receive the inward work of the Spirit of God, whereby he cuts away the effects of the old nature and sets us free to live according to the new nature given us by Christ. In fact, this passage in Colossians goes right on, having talked about not the circumcision by men with hands, but the circumcision of the heart, he got, having been buried with him by baptism and death. And it likens baptism to the experience of circumcision. So, here it is. We have, first of all, we can celebrate our deliverance from the old life in the midst of baptism. First of all, we can sell by taking authority over the power and dominion of sin. Secondly, by claiming freedom from the old life. And then, thirdly, right in your notes, we can put it there, we, we can conduct a funeral service. Actually, what you're going to write in your notes is a little later on. But you'll see, the third point is, we conduct a funeral service of the old life, and we rise to live a new life in Christ. Now, uh, what happens in baptism is very interesting. Uh, one time there was a pastor who was teaching a, a group of boys and girls. And in this uh, class, he was asking them to, he was telling them what, about baptism. And he asked them to define baptism, write what baptism was. And this little girl said, of her definition of baptism, she says, in baptism we drown the devil. Well, out of the mouth of babes. I mean, what an excellent definition of baptism. The source of our old life, the, the, the sinful life, is, is the enemy, it's the devil. And so in baptism, we drown the devil. Well, that's exactly what Paul is saying in Romans 6. Look at the notes there, Romans 6, 4. Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism. When he died and when the Father with glorious power brought him back to life again, and you were given this new life to enjoy. Literally, we can picture in our mind, in our spirit, the old life, the devil, and all that he's prompted us to do, we can actually picture him being drowned under the water. In uh, Call the Discipleship, Carlos Ortez, a number of years ago, who is a Argentine evangelist pastor, and uh, you know the Latin people are a lot more dramatic and demonstrative than some of us uh, northerners are that come from Anglo-Saxon background. And uh, so he was right telling how when he performs a baptism, he takes the candidate and he says, I kill you in the name of Jesus Christ, and he brings him back up. He says that, so you may live the new life with him. I kill you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, that's pretty right on. I mean, that's what we can do. We absolutely put to death the old part. And we dramatically display that, as he says, in baptism. The, so look in your notes. The manifestation of the old life need to be cut loose within the depth of our heart and buried. A death and resurrection takes place. God changes the bent and direction of our nature from Adams to Christ, from hostility and rebellion to submission and faith. Now, how does this happen? All of this we receive by faith. 
And it's really interesting, I think, that the very next verse in Colossians chapter 2, where it had just been talking about the circumcision of the heart, goes on to say this, For in baptism, you see how your old nature died with him and was buried with him, and then you came up out of death with him into a new life because you trusted in the word of the mighty God who raised Christ from the dead. You came up out of this death into new life because you trusted. You know that all God's gracious work in our life we receive in the same way. We've already learned that we receive eternal life by faith. Faith is the hand, you remember, that reaches out and receives it and takes it from the Lord. God offers it, God's provided it, but we have to take it by faith. The answer to our prayers, we receive by faith. The other things that God wants to do in our life, healing, how do we receive it? We receive it by faith. All of this we receive by faith. What God wants to accomplish in our life in baptism, same thing. What we receive from the Lord's Supper, we learned last week, how do we receive it? We receive it by faith. What God wants to do in our life through baptism, how do we receive it? We receive it by faith. A person can go through the form of baptism, and it can mean absolutely nothing. The first old church that I pastored was up in the state of New Hampshire, and it was just one of these old country churches that you've seen pictures of, white clapboard. And I went into this and looked at the pulpit and the little choir loft up there. The first time I went, went in and viewed it, and I thought, my goodness, I thought this was a Baptist church. Where's the baptistry? Couldn't see it. Well, it was there, but it was under the pulpit. So when it came time for us to have a baptismal service, we had to move the pulpit out of the way, pull up the rug, pick up some boards, and there was the baptistry. And the only way you got from one side of the uh, platform to the other, or one side of the baptistry to the other, was you walked across a plank that was right there in the middle. And people, you'd fill this baptistry, and there you'd have your baptismal services. And I, I thought one day, I thought, well, what happened if I slipped and fell off of that thing and fell into baptistry? Would I be baptized? And, and I said, well, no, of course I won't be baptized because the water's nothing. The, the, the tank is nothing. What is it that's significant about the baptism? What's significant about it is that I have faith that by faith, I'm receiving Jesus. By faith, I'm putting my trust and confidence in him. By faith, I'm believing him to cut off the old life. By faith, I'm believing him to drown the devil in my life and to set me free so that I can walk a new life with him. You see, anything has two values. It has the intrinsic value and has the official value. Okay, now here's a $20 bill. The intrinsic value of this $20 bill is pennies. Maybe not even pennies. Just the paper and the ink it was printed on, right? But I can go down to the store and I can give this $20 bill and I get $20 worth of goods. Why? Because the Federal Reserve stands behind this and says that bill symbolizes the United States government guaranteeing that this is worth $20. The intrinsic value of baptism is just some water and going down in it or sprinkling or whatever. What is that? Nothing. But behind that stands the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. It stands the Word of God. And uh, <clears throat> what we've been just reading that if we are buried with him in baptism, we die like he died, that we can rise to new life. So this is why baptism, you can write this in your note, baptism is not a spectator sport. Now some of you may have uh, <clears throat> gone to baptism before and you just wanted to observe, it's like, I mean, you went to a shower or 
baby shower, or you went to a football game, or whatever. Uh, but instead, when you go to baptism, remember, this is a faith experience. Supposing that you're in the morning worship service, and the pastor or someone brings up uh, a member of the congregation that is really desperately sick, and so the pastor and the elders of the church now are going to lead the congregation in praying for that person? Now, what is it that your role is? Do you sit back there while everybody else is praying for this desperate ill person? And you think of the roast that you're going to have when you get home. You think of the rest of the things you're going to do during the day. And you're just pa kind of passing the time until this prayer is over. Well, I certainly hope not. If you have any concern for this person at all, and you have any belief that God can meet a need, then you're right there. If you're not out loud saying amen, you're saying amen inside. You're saying, yes, Lord, do it. Yes, Lord, get a hold of that sickness. Yes, Lord, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And you are praying along with everybody else, right? Well, now, when somebody comes to be baptized, what are you going to do? Just watch and think, oh, that's really nice, and rejoice in this public demonstration? Well, yes, but there's much more you can do than that. This is why we, baptism is a public ceremony. We don't do private baptisms any more than we do private communions or private Lord's suppers, unless a person is desperately sick in the hospital and can't come, because this is a body function. This is... The church, this is the body of Christ getting together and believing for one another in baptism and or feeding on the body of Christ as it would be in the Lord's Supper. And so in baptism, as somebody's being baptized, then you're exercising your faith along with their faith in saying, yes, Lord, set them free. Yes, Lord, weed the patch. Yes, Lord, cut away all that. Yes, Lord, circumcise their heart. Yes, Lord. Let them be free now to walk in newness of life with you. That's what you're doing. So when I baptize somebody, I don't just put them down and bring them back up and say, oh, see this nice little public confession of faith in Jesus Christ. But I say, by the authority of God's word, and the power of the Holy Spirit, I now believe God to set you free from all that would bind you and hinder you and keep you from walking the Christian life. I believe the Holy Spirit to come and circumcise your heart as I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the water doesn't do it. I don't do it. I can't do it. But Jesus can do it. And we, by faith, receive his work operating in this life. It's so important that we have this plank in our experience with the Lord so that we're free to walk in the ways that he has cho chosen to, to lead us. We're free from all that junk from the past. Will it ever trouble us again? Well, yeah, it probably will. But now, just like when we exercised faith for the forgiveness of our sins, now we can look upon the sinful nature, the old nature in our life, as dead and buried. And we can look upon and receive by faith the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, there's a couple other things we want to share with you as far as baptism is concerned. And uh, you can write, first of all, in your notes, the Greek word for, bap for baptism is baptizo. And this word invariably means in the scriptures to immerse, to dip, or to plunge beneath. To immerse, to dip, or to plunge beneath. Now, why would this word be used if that meaning was not to be carried out and fulfilled? Okay? Another thing is this. The New Testament accounts give the Impression of immersion. For instance, in Mark, it tells about how they went down and were baptized in the Jordan River. It doesn't say they were baptized at the Jordan River. It, it isn't just identifying the location, but it says they were baptized in the Jordan River. And you can write these uh, comments in your notes there if you would. Baptized in the Jordan River. 
in John chapter 3, it says they were, it tells about a baptismal experience, and it says they were baptized because there was much water there. Well, now, if the form of baptism was to be sprinkling a couple of drops of water on a person's head, then why would they need much water? But if they're going to fulfill the literal meaning of the word baptizo, and people are going to be immersed and dunked, they've got to have a lot of water if you've got a lot of people. And the, we already have seen that there were a lot of people involved. In Acts chapter 8, we have the story of Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, and it tells at the end of that story how Philip and the eunuch went down into the water for baptism and came up out of the water. Well, it seems to indicate that gives the impression at least of immersion. Did you know that the historical and archaeological studies which have been done over the years have shown that up until the Middle Ages, for over a thousand years, the practice of baptism, both in the Roman Catholic Church and in the English Church, the Episcopal Anglican Church, as well as in other churches, was by immersion. The Roman Catholic scholars even today will, admit, will realize, I mean, they'll say, the New Testament way of baptism was by immersion. But what happened was that by uh, a determination of Pope and Council in 1311 A.D., this was set aside. And sprinkling was instituted instead because it was, I suppose, easier to involve as much, and so they substituted. In the Anglican Church, the, the Anglican immersion was laid aside as the form of baptism in favor of sprinkling in 1644 A.D. That means for 1,600 years. It was the official mode of baptism, and then they laid it aside. And then only by one vote, vote of the council. In fact, you can, they have uncovered uh, churches and worship places in uh, Europe, back, dating back to the Mid-Ages, and, and they found huge pools there. And uh, the, the scholars don't think it was for the people to do their washing. They think that it was where they came to be baptized. They had some other strange ways of baptizing, like they didn't want to pollute the water with clothing and a few things like that. So, but we were, you know, but they, they did believe in baptizing by immersion. But to me, the most important thing here, and, and I, I'm not going to take issue with anybody, but I just think that in going to an easier form, which many of the Christian groups have done, we've lost something. We've lost the symbolism. We've lost the whole picture. We've lost much of the concept of what God wants to give us. And so it seems to me that immersion is the perfect symbol. Take that verse, the most definitive verse in all the Bible about baptism, Romans 6, 4, where it says we're buried with him through baptism into death. But like as Christ raised from the dead, so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, there are three forms of baptism, main, main forms of baptism, modes of baptism are used today. There is sprinkling, whereby a little water is put in a bowl, and the person who's doing the baptizing takes some drops and sprinkles it on the head. There's another form of baptism, which is pouring, and uh, you get a little wetter on this one because uh, they, took, they take a, a, a pitcher of water, usually a small pitcher, and they'll pour this on a person's head. And, uh, and then there's immersion where they take you into a pool and they put you under back and forth. All right. Now let's just apply those three different ways of baptism to this verse and see what I'm talking about when I say, you know, the symbolism isn't really there. We were buried by immersion into death. I mean, we were buried by sprinkling into death. But like as Christ raised from the dead, so we should walk in newness of life. What's that got to do with burial and resurrection? We were buried by pouring into death. But like as Christ, we were buried by dunking, I mean immersing. That like as Christ was buried and raised from the dead, so we should walk in newness of life. It just seems to me 
that it conveys, it pictures, it symbolizes the thing that God wants to, that Jesus wants to have us. Now, what about infants? Let me just make a few comments on that. I don't believe there's anything in the scriptures that authorizes or sanctions baptizing infants. Now, I know there are some passages that speak of so-and-so and and their household being baptized. It could be that there were very small children being baptized. I don't think so. For other reasons, I'll share with you. But I have baptized whole households. And there wasn't anyone in that household who was below the age of accountability. And so everyone in that household understood. They accepted Jesus. They wanted to follow him. And they, and, and they were baptized. The baptism of babies was started and based upon an unscriptural position. What would you do if you couldn't read or write And the only person who had a copy of the Bible, God's Word, was the priest in a nearby village. And the only way you had any understanding of what was in God's Word was what that priest told you. And he had been told by his superiors that babies were to be baptized. And if they weren't baptized, they'd go to hell. They, they, They at least wouldn't get into limbo. What would you do as a parent? Well, you'd have your babies baptized, wouldn't you? But you see, the Bible doesn't say that. And in fact, it says the opposite. Jesus, for instance, took the children and put it on his knee in Matthew 19, verse 14. He said, except you become like these little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. These little children hadn't been baptized. It wasn't a Jewish thing to baptize their babies. And yet Jesus said, here's an example of what it's like to get into the kingdom of heaven. You remember in the Old Testament when King David sinned grossly uh, with Bathsheba and then had her husband murdered on the front lines of the army and then took her to be his wife. And the child that was born as a result of that indiscretion, that adultery, uh, became sick, desperately sick. And David went to his um, bed, and he wept and cried and mourned. And finally, the child died, and his servants were afraid to tell him. But David saw them whispering together and said to them, is the child dead? And they finally had to answer. Well, when they, as soon as he knew the child was dead, he got up. He called for a change of clothes, called for a bath, called for some food, and the servants stood there with their mouth open. What in the world? And I said, David, while the child was alive, you you grieved almost as unto death. And now the child has died. And he said to them, the child will not come to me, but I shall go to be with him. There was this sense in David's heart. This child was secure in God's love until David would go and join him in God's presence. I think it's very fitting with all the Bible teaches to believe that small children are covered by the grace of God until they come to the age of accountability where they can make their own choices and decisions. Where is that? I'm sure I don't know. Probably differs with different children. But why would a person be baptized until they had come to the place where they understood that they had sinned, where they understood that Jesus had died for them, where they had made their commitment to Jesus, and now we're going to follow him. And this was a choice out of their own heart. You'll notice in, the, in your notes that there are a number of things that the Bible indicates were characteristics of those people who were baptized in the New Testament. They were, for instance, the repentant, they were receivers, they were confessors, They were open-hearted, they were believers, and all of these prerequisites seem to clearly exclude small children because children couldn't do that. Well, now let me just give a concluding thought or two. 
we've been learning that everything God does in us is a growing experience. We learned conversion is a growing experience. We learn salvation is not an event, but it's a process that starts at the new birth and it's going to complete when we get to be with the Lord. Okay? Well, now, in the same sense, I believe, we can look at baptism in some way. When I went to a, one of the churches that I pastored earlier back east, it was, this is a Baptist church, but I want to tell you, it was the tradition in that church that every living, breathing kid was to be baptized when they were in the fourth grade. And so when I got there, I found out all the kids were baptized. It didn't matter whether they knew what they were doing. It didn't matter whether they want to be. Their parents had seen to it. They got in a... Well, I didn't baptize anybody for several years because I wanted this to be an experience, not of tradition, that when you're fourth grade, you're baptized, but I wanted this to be an experience of the heart. And you know what happened in that church? As God began to move and break through in that church, many of these young people came to me. Now they were junior high, senior high, and they, had a, they, they, they now had a real experience with Christ. They now had found him in a real way, and they said, Pastor, couldn't we be baptized? It would mean so much to us to be baptized now. When we were baptized, we didn't understand what we were doing. Our mom wanted us to be baptized. We were baptized. And I said, well, of course you can be baptized. And so we baptize them. I've, I've had adults come to me, many of them, who had an experience of baptism earlier in their life, but it wasn't a life-changing experience. It wasn't connected to a real commitment to Jesus Christ. And now they were committing their life to Christ. Can't we be baptized? Of course you can be baptized. I was baptized when I was 12 years of age in a beautiful lake up in New Hampshire. It was very meaningful to me. And I wanted to, dis to follow Jesus, and I wanted to display in my life his, uh, his life. And, and so I was baptized in that setting, and I'm so thankful that I was. But you know, a number of years later, I had a chance to lead a group of people on a tour into Israel. And the opportunity came to be baptized in the Jordan River. Now, you may say, well, that you just wanted. That would be a lark to be baptized in the Jordan River. No, that wasn't it at all. In the meantime, between that 12 years of age and where I was then, I had discovered some of the things I've shared with you tonight. I'd come to see some of these scriptures <coughs> about what God wanted to do to break away the old and establish the new. And so another pastor and I were baptized for the circumcision of our heart, for the releasing of our life in the Jordan River. It was a great experience. I don't recommend that people get baptized every year. But hey, if there's something new that's vital and dynamic in your life and it will be a, an aid to what God's doing in your life, why not? We have a lot of people have had through the years in the, as I've been a pastor, many, many people who've come, found Jesus in a beautiful way in their life, have face this matter of baptism. And it's been a real struggle for them because they come from a family tradition where this would be anathema. They come from a family tradition where if you were baptized, you already were baptized when you were a baby, now you get baptized as an adult, you're repudiating your upbringing. This is what the idea is. And what I've tried to show people through the years is this, hey, Anything that was done in good intention, anything that was done out of the love of parents, it's a good thing. And if you were baptized as a baby or you were baptized as a small child and your parents wanted this or felt that this was going to help you spiritually or secure, be, be a security to you spiritually, well, thank God for the interest and desire that was in their hearts. You're not repudiating that. But the Christian life is an unfolding life. I mean, we learn new truth all the time. We come into new experience all the time, right? So it's not taking away. It's not repudiating. It's just adding to what God has already done. And if, if we can look at 
the work of God in, in that way, even in this matter of baptism, especially when it comes to family situations, then many times God can bring uh, an understanding whereby uh, families can support each other and, and um, can love each other in these ways. Baptism is an important plank. And uh, it's one of those things that God wants each and every one of us to experience fully and completely in our life and to receive by faith all that Jesus' death and burial and resurrection provided for us. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that as you call us to follow you, you give us this, uh, this, this beginning ordinance. You ask us to come now and declare ourselves publicly and receive from you the freeing up, the putting to death, the releasing from the old life that we might walk in newness with you. Lord, make this real to each of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.